Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of If Cats Disappeared from the World by Genki Kawamura. So this is translated Japanese fiction, over one million copies sold in uh, Japan, uh, published by Picador. I'm going to read you the blurb here, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs here, and then share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, what would you sacrifice for an extra day of life? The devil picked that moment to announce in his usual cheerful manner the next item he'd make disappear. I couldn't think about anything anymore, so I said yes, just like that. At that point, the thought that it could happen to my cat Cabbage had never crossed my mind. So, again, as we go through, different things slowly disappear. So we get this near the start. Um, so I pulled out a sheet of blank paper and wrote the title at the top of the page. Ten things I want to do before I die. I was feeling more depressed already. I'm going to die soon, and I'm wasting my time writing lists. You've got to be kidding. As I wrote, I lost the plot even more. But somehow I managed to come up with a list, all the time avoiding the devil, who was trying to peek over my shoulder, and forcibly removing the cat, who, like all cats, thinks it's a good idea to sit on whatever you're trying to work on or read. Okay, so here we go. Go skydiving. Climb Mount Everest. Speed along the autobahn in a Ferrari. Go along to a traditional three-day-long feast of gourmet Chinese food. Take a ride on a Transformer's back. Find love in these final days of our lives. Go on a date with Princess Leia. Turn a corner just in time to run into a beautiful woman carrying a cup of coffee and watch our passionate love affair unfold from there. Run into the girl I had a crush on in school while sheltering from the rain. Did I mention I'd like to fall in love just once? And uh, here he talks about the death of his mother and uh, they have uh, cats called uh, cabbage and lettuce. So then four years ago, she really did leave us. What a coincidence. I have the thing that lettuce had, said mum, laughing faintly. Just like lettuce, the weight dropped off mum, and in the end she went to sleep and simply never woke up. She died peacefully. Take care of cabbage, she implored me before she died. Fate, it seems, has a sense of humour. I'll end up dying before cabbage, just like mum. She'd be pretty unimpressed with me, I'm sure. I couldn't just imagine her saying she should have left cabbage with someone else. And then so phones um, disappear, and uh, we have this little passage here which is, you know, just, I guess, relevant to our time, so... On the train on the way to work, I was always looking at my phone. Even when I was watching a movie, I checked my phone regularly. And when I was eating. When my lunch break came around, I got this terrible urge to look at my phone. Even when I was with Cabbage, I'd end up looking at the phone instead of playing with him. Being such a slave to it made me hate myself. Mobile phones have been around for only about 20 years, but in just that short time they've managed to take complete control over us. In just 20 short years, something that we don't really need has come to rule our lives, making us believe that we can't do without it. When human beings invented the mobile phone, they also invented the anxiety of not having one. But who knows, maybe we went through the same thing when people first started sending letters. It's the same with the internet. Throughout human history, we've given birth to new things, only to lose to the old. Only to lose the old. When you put it like that, maybe God was onto something when he accepted the devil's proposal. Maybe. We get this little philosophical bit here. Love has to end, that's all. And even, th and even though everyone knows it, they still fall in love. I guess it's the same with life. We all know it has to end someday, but even so we act as if we're going to live forever. Like love, life is beautiful because it has to end. We get this as well, which I think is relatable because I'm just about old enough to remember, you know, the days before mobile phones. With the invention of mobile phones, the idea of not being able to find the person you're supposed to be meeting disappeared. People forgot what it meant to be kept waiting. But the feeling of patience and not being able to get hold of her, the warm feeling of hope and the shivering cold were all still fresh in my mind. And um, then he wants, to, he wants to talk about this with his, his love interest. And uh, so he goes, My hand dived into my pocket to grab my phone. But of course, damn, it wasn't there. No more phones. This was so annoying. I really wanted to let her know right away. I looked back at the theatre as I made my way... I looked back at the theatre as I made my way slowly back up the street. Then I remembered what it was like when I was a student and I'd wait for her to call. It felt the same way now. I wanted to let her know what I was thinking right away but couldn't. And strangely enough, it was when I couldn't speak to her that she was on my mind the most. In the old days before mobile phones and email, it would have been a letter. People would imagine their letters reaching their loved one and wonder how they'd react. Then they would eagerly wait for a letter and reply, checking the mailbox each day. Presents are like that too. It's not the thing itself, but what it might mean to the person you gave it to. And it's their expression and how happy they'll be to receive it that you have in mind when you pick the gift. And I just like the irony of a character in a book saying this, he goes, It's too fantastical. Life is stranger than fiction. So this gets me onto something of a rant of mine, I guess. Um, I, I mentioned in a video that um, I feel as though the Gregorian calendar is like just an arbitrary calendar. I don't understand why we start 
the new year at the point in which we do where I feel like it would make more sense to start it at, for me probably the spring equinox so the days are of equal length and they start getting longer um, that seems to me to make more sense than when the Gregorian calendar starts but anyway somebody had a massive go at me because they disagreed with me um, in the comments <laughs> as happens sometimes but this uh, bit here reminded me of that so so why are there clocks in the first place I thought Aloha might know. That's a good question. But even before clocks were invented, it was only humans that had a sense of time. Huh? I don't get it. Seeing I was puzzled, Aloha went on. Okay, stay with me. You see, time, or that thing we call time, is simply produced by arbitrarily determined rules. Rules that human beings made up. I'm not saying that the cycle of the sun rising and setting doesn't exist as a natural phenomenon, because obviously it does. But it's humans who have imposed an organising system on that process and called it time, giving names and numbers to different parts of the day, like, say, 6 o'clock, 12 o'clock, midnight, and so on. Which, by the way, I was going to annoy that guy by telling him about my plan to decimalise time, uh, but I didn't think he'd like that. Basically, um, you know, you get 36.525 10-day weeks a year, each of 10 hours made up of 100 minutes. We just have to change the length of probably 100 seconds. It'll just give us different times. It's fine. We'll get used to it. Anyway. Ooh, right. So, human beings may think that they're looking at the world as it is, but they've got it all wrong. In actual fact, they've just imposed a meaning on things, come up with a definition of what the world is all about, which happens to suit them. And I just thought it might be interesting for people to see what the world would be like without that system of telling the time, which humans just made up for their own convenience. You know, just to mix it up a bit. Somebody has circled part of this as well, because I got this second hand, so they clearly like this same part that I'm going to read here. When you think about it, people sleep, wake up, work and eat according to the established set of rules we call time. In other words, we set our lives by the clock. Human beings went to the trouble of inventing rules that impose limits on their lives, boxing them up into hours, days and years, and then they invented clocks to make time's rule over us even more precise. And I like this little bit here too. Um, I have heard this sort of said before. I think it's roughly true. I don't think it's 100% true, but like, true enough. I've heard it said a mammal's heart beats around 2 billion times during its lifetime. The life expectancy of, for example, an elephant is about 50 years. For horses, it's 20 years, and cats, 10 years, while a mouse will last only, f while a mouse will last only for about two years. But whatever the average lifespan, all of their hearts beat around two billion times. The average life expectancy of a human being is 70 years. I wondered if my heart had beaten two million. I wondered if my heart had beaten two billion times. So here he says, I remember what my mother said a long time ago. Cats and humans have been partners for over 10,000 years. And what you realise when you've lived with a cat for a long time is that we may think we own them, but that's not the way it is. They simply allow us the pleasure of their company. And then later on we get, on the one hand, they say that only humans have a concept of death. Cats don't see it coming. It, it, doesn't, call them, it doesn't cause them fear and anxiety like it does humans. And then humans end up keeping cats as pets, despite our angst over mortality, even though we know that the cat will die long before we do, causing the owner untold grief. But then again, human beings can never grieve their own death. Death is always something that happens to others around. And then uh, he gets a letter from his mother, and um, I'm just gonna read this, this passage out. I sat down on the sofa in the theater lobby and put cabbage on my lap. Then I carefully opened the letter. On the top of the first page in large letters, she had beautiful handwriting. It said, 10 things I want to do before I die. The title was a bit of an anticlimax. So both mother and son, without knowing it, had written the same thing. I couldn't help but laugh and carried on to the second page. I don't have much longer to live, so I thought I'd note down 10 things I'd like to do before I die. I'd like to travel and enjoy delicious gourmet meals, and I'd like to kit myself out in some really stylish clothes. But then as I wrote these things, I began to wonder, was this really the kind of thing that was important to me? Is this really what I want to do before I die? I started a new list when suddenly I realised that all of the things I wanted to do before I died were for you. Your life will go on for many years beyond mine, and in the course of that life there'll be both good times and bad. You'll experience joy, but there will also be times of sadness and pain. So I decided to write down 10 beautiful things about you so that whenever you're going through a difficult time, you'll be given the courage and self-belief to go on. So instead of a list of 10 things I want to do before I die, this is what I wrote. Things that are beautiful and good about you. When people are sad, you're able to cry along with them. And when people are happy, you're able to share their joy with them. You look really, you look really sweet when you're asleep. Your dimples when you smile. Your habit of rubbing your nose when you're worried or anxious. Your concern for the needs of others. Whenever I caught a cold, you helped with the housework and acted like you enjoyed doing it. 
You always ate whatever I cooked as if it were the most delicious thing in the world. How you'd think deeply and ponder over things. And after all that brooding, you always seem to come up with the best solution to the problem. As you go on with your life, always remember the things that are good in you. They're your gifts. As long as you have these things, you'll find happiness and you'll make the people around you happy. Thank you for everything you've done for me and goodbye. I hope you always keep hold of these things that are so beautiful about you. So yeah, overall, I thought this was really beautifully written and presumably well translated. I mean, I don't speak Japanese and I haven't read the original, so I can't vouch for that. But I did personally really enjoy it. Um, I would call it, I guess, contemporary literary fiction, contemporary translated literary fiction. Um, just some really stunning passages, uh, as you've seen from the ones I read out. I overall would probably give this four, maybe 4.25 out of five. I thought it was very good. So there we have it, that's what I thought of If Cats Disappeared from the World by Genki Kawamura. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought about it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.